Hey guys, I'm Mark. Welcome back to the shop. Today I'm going to show you how I made this end grain cutting board with a really cool brick wall pattern. Check it out. A few months ago I made a video about an end grain cutting board with a crazy pattern. If you haven't seen that one yet, I'll leave a link in the description so you can see another style of board. That video went over really well, but it was more of a music montage than a how-to, and I ended up with tons of questions about how and why I did some of the things that I did. So it's time to revisit the end grain cutting board building process, this time making a brick wall pattern and offering what I hope will be a much better explanation. I figured I would spare you the general flattening and squaring of my rough cut maple and cherry that I'm going to be using for this build. So to start with, after ripping the pieces to width, I ran the boards through my drum sander to make sure that I would have perfect gluing surfaces. I'm going to use this drum sander a lot in this project, so in the interest of time, let's just assume that every seam that will get glued together has been run through here. I set up a stop lock at my radial arm saw to make sure that I got all my cuts to the same length. To look like a wall, each row of bricks needs to be staggered, so I ripped one of the bricks in half. If you can't picture this yet, it'll make a little more sense later on. I ripped my block of maple into a bunch of quarter inch thick strips that are going to make up the vertical mortar lines. Normally, I would cut strips this thin on the bandsaw, but I just ruined my only bandsaw blade by hitting a nail hidden in a slab of walnut. So working carefully, I got the job done using the table saw. In order to make horizontal mortar lines, I needed to make an end grain board that was the full width of the finished cutting board. I did this by cutting a big maple board into short pieces so I could glue them back together side to side. Next, it was just a matter of gluing all the pieces together in the right order, so I slathered on some glue and got them ready for clamping. Well, it's been a little while since I made a cutting board and I forgot you don't need glue on this piece. Usually that's why you start with the front one down and then it reminds you that one doesn't need the glue, but I skipped that part this time. And so that it doesn't glue itself to my clamps, I'm just going to have to clean this glue back off. So at this point I'm going to glue together these extra blocks that will end up being the horizontal mortar in the brick wall pattern. Uh, ideally, you wouldn't be working with pieces this little, maybe you'd be making half a dozen of these boards at once so you could actually have this be a long piece and not, not have to sort of piecemeal it together like this. Um, and also because I was only trying to use the uh, single piece of maple that I had available to me, I'm just trying to make do with what I have. So. This isn't ideal, but it'll get the job done. I'm mostly going to be clamping it with the one, the, the left side clamp first, my left. This one is here to just hold it in place, try to keep it level until I get some pressure on it from the one side. But I've, I've taken a look here and lined up the grain the way I want it. And now I just need to go back and glue them together. That one I'm not going to put glue on at this point. I just need glue on these three surfaces and then squeeze it together. And as long as we're talking about the glue, I always use the Tight Bond 3. This is the waterproof type of glue. That way when you're washing the cutting board, it doesn't dissolve, it doesn't deteriorate the glue. Now you can probably get away with Tight Bond 2 as well. Tight Bond 2 is water resistant. Um, and I think a lot of people do use it. It's a little bit cheaper. It, it, uh, there's nothing wrong with it, but I figure glue is cheap compared to somebody returning a board, um, you having to just fix something that you could have prevented in the first place. So I'd rather just use the Tight Bond 3 because I know it works. I've got experience with it. That'll work just fine. So when this dries, it's actually thick enough that I can get two strips off of it, which is what I need. So I'll end up cutting it in half this way and then turning it so it's end grain and then ripping the quarter inch mortar strips out of it in that direction. But for now, we'll let it dry overnight and we can get back to it tomorrow. I'm ready for bed. After the glue dried, I used the drum sander to make quick work of flattening the board. 
I checked my progress by putting it on a flat surface and trying to make it rock. At this point, there was still a little wiggle, so I ran it through a few more times. Now we are good to go. Now I want to point out that you don't have to have a drum sander to do this. I've done it many times using a, uh, a router sled to flatten it or using just a belt sander. Uh, it takes a lot more time and a lot more effort, but you can still get the same result. Uh, it's because I've done it with those other methods that I decided I wanted a drum sander. And it's definitely a luxury item, but now that I've had one, I wouldn't go back to doing it the old way. So you can do it without it. This just makes it a whole lot easier and faster. Next, I use my crosscut sled on my table saw to square off one edge. Then, starting with that edge against the fence, I cut the board down into strips. The width of these strips ends up being the thickness of the finished cutting board. My solid maple board was more than twice as thick as it needed to be, so I split it down the middle, then cut it into quarter inch strips. Once again, I had to use the table saw while I waited for my new bandsaw blade to arrive in the mail. Time for the final glue up. I rotated all of the pieces so they are end grain up, then I swapped every other row of bricks end for end while placing strips of mortar in between each row. Now you can see how having that little half brick on the end makes the staggered pattern. After determining their order, I laid all the pieces back on their sides and spread out some glue. Then, one more quick assembly and it was clamp time. Well, the board is back out of the clamps after what I had intended to be the final glue up, but after I went in the house last night, I started thinking about that extra piece of maple that I would glued together, which was just an overestimation of how much uh, mortar I needed in this. And I decided I'm gonna cut this up and make a border to go all the way around the outside of this. So it's gonna add an extra day worth of gluing and labor and whatnot, but we're gonna have a better product when we're finished. I did a quick flattening job on the drum sander just to make everything line up more easily, then glued the long sides on. After drying, I squared up the ends with the crosscut sled, then glued the short sides on. Up to this point, I've been using 60 grit paper in the drum sander to flatten the boards. Once they're flat, I switched the paper to 220 grit to take out most of the deep scratches. I like to use a jig to help me route a consistent juice groove into the top of the board. This jig works by locking the board in place and creating a frame all the way around the outside for a router to ride against. I usually do this in two passes. The first pass removes the bulk of the material, but tends to leave a few burn marks. The second pass is very shallow, which I find helps remove most of the burns. The trick to avoiding burns completely is to never stop moving the router. When the router stops moving, the bit is still spinning at a high RPM and the resulting friction causes burns in a hurry. That's why a CNC machine would be the ultimate way to add a juice groove. The machine never has to pause to readjust, it just goes until the job is done. Any remaining burns can be taken out with a little elbow grease. I like to find a deep socket that matches the contour, then wrap it with sandpaper to smooth out the groove. Then it's time for lots of sanding. Even using 220 grit paper, the drum sander leaves pretty deep scratches in end grain. So I started back at 40 grit in my palm sander to speed things up. After the scratches were gone, I moved up through 80 and 120 grit to get the board nice and smooth. The next step is something I find really important that I don't hear about very often. The board needs to get wet to raise any fibers that might have just gotten flattened down during the sanding. Don't overdo it. Just wash it about the same way you would as if you had just finished cutting food on it. Then, set it aside to dry overnight. When you do this, the board is going to feel so rough that you'll think you never sanded it at all. At this point, I jump straight to 220 grit paper, and in just a minute or two, I have a silky smooth surface that won't get roughed up again next time it gets washed. I used some 220 paper wrapped around a sanding sponge to take off the sharp edges. You can use a round over or a chamfer bit and a router on the edges too if you want. I just prefer the squared off look. Next, I heat up my brand and test it a few times on a scrap of wood that's the same as the surface that I'm going to be branding. In my last cutting board video, the number one question I got was, where did you get your brand? Now this is not a sponsored video, but in order to head off that question, I wanted to get out in front of it this time. My branding iron came from Branding Irons Unlimited. Their website is brandingirons.com. So if you want one for yourself, go check them out. 
After making sure the temperature was just right, I lined up the cutting board and hit it with the iron. I used this huge airtight box to soak my boards in. This way, I can leave the mineral oil in it and store it out of the way when I don't need it. I like to do this part in my house where there isn't so much dust floating around. I carefully set the board in the oil to let it soak. In the case of mineral oil splashback, it's smart to have a towel down ahead of time. Then I made sure it was completely covered and is allowed to drink up all the oil it wants. I've found that it tends to be completely saturated in about 15 to 20 minutes. I cut these little notches in some scrap wood to span the top of the box so the cutting boards could sit there and drip dry. I also made shallow cuts all the way around so that any flowing oil would hit that spot and drip into the box instead of draining out. I let most of the oil drip back into the box, then dry off the board with an old rag. I let it sit like that for a day or so before putting my final conditioner on it. I mix three parts of mineral oil to one part beeswax and allow the wax to completely melt over a low heat. So with this hot wax and mineral oil solution, the wax is able to soak down into the pores and then when it solidifies, it actually seals off the wood and makes it so that you don't have to refinish the board for much longer time than you would if you just used the mineral oil. I apply the wax conditioner in a pretty thick coat to every surface, then let it sit for a few minutes so it gets a chance to soak in. Once the wax has started to re-solidify, it won't soak in anymore, so I wipe off the excess. I always make more conditioner than I need. It's easy to save and reheat the next time I need to use it. The final step is to put on some feet. I've tried many varieties of these rubber feet over the years, and I decided I like these square ones the best because they seem to stick to the counter better. Make sure that you use stainless steel screws on cutting boards so they don't rust. Well, that's pretty much my complete guide to making end grain cutting boards because no matter what pattern you go with, the steps are pretty much the same. You just have to rearrange your boards a little bit differently. So this video got a little bit longer than I intended it to for a project that at least at face value seems so simple. Uh, but there's an awful lot of little details that I've picked up over the last couple of years of making these things that I wanted to cram into it. I've got links to all the different things that I used in this video down in the description. So if you're looking for any of the same parts and pieces that I used on this board right here, that's where you're going to find them. And if you've got any other questions that I didn't field in the video, please leave me a comment. I would be happy to help you out. If you're new to the channel, I encourage you to hit that subscribe button. And if you're already a subscriber, I suggest you hit that little bell icon so you can get notified every time I upload a new video. I appreciate everybody for checking this out, and I'll be back soon with another project. See you guys next time.